All right, everybody, welcome in to Pickaxe and Roll, brought to you by our good friends over at Superbook Sports. I'm your host, Ryan Blackburn at NBA Blackburn on Twitter, part of the Mile High Sports Podcast Network, and I am excited to talk about last night's Denver Nuggets win as the Nuggets defeat the San Antonio Spurs final score 117 106. Really appreciate everybody for stopping by. Apologies if things are kind of laggy. I'm not really sure what's going on. It might just be a me issue with StreamYard, but doing my best to make sure it is all good. Hopefully everybody's having a great morning. I see a whole bunch of regulars in the chat. Dr. Van Nostrand's in the chat. Nadine Marcus is in the chat. The Invisible Man is in the chat. Thank you so much everybody for hopping in really do appreciate all the love and support if you're new to the show would love it if you could rate review and subscribe to the podcast like and subscribe on the youtube channel all that jazz really appreciate it as we continue to uh, just sort of expand and do everything that we can on that side of things it's always a joy to be able to put in this work so thank you so much for tuning in All right, let's get into the show. Let's talk about last night's game. I've got some different things I want to go over, but we got to start with last night's win, obviously. That's the most important thing, right? Denver gets the win, 117-106. They reclaim, technically, they reclaim first place in the Western Conference with a record of 47-20. and They've done a good job. They've done everything that they can. They are now 11-1. and post all-star break and have done just about everything you could ask for from the perspective of taking care of business. If you have paid any attention to anything that I have said over the course of these last few weeks, this San Antonio game was the one that I was circling is like, yeah, they're not going to win that one. And they did. They won it anyway. So maybe I just reverse jinxed it into hell. Uh, Maybe that's just what happened, but my bad. Clearly not the analyst that you're hoping for me to be. But look, last year, Denver lost this exact game. They lost this exact game to Samu Mamakelishvili and everybody on the the San Antonio Spurs from Zach Collins to Kelton Johnson to Trey Jones and everybody in between. Denver lost that game in the middle of March last year. And it was actually one of the reasons why Nikola Jokic did not win an MVP last year. But this time, this time around, he delivers. He does a great job. He puts Victor Wembenyama and the Spurs in their place. And it was a great, great thing to see. Um, And Nadine Marcus says this earlier before we went live. I don't know how he did it, but he scored 31 points on the best defender in the NBA in three quarters. And that is why Nikola Jokic is as good as he is. Some of the shots that he was hitting last night were amazing. They're amazing shots that you just never, ever want to see a seven-footer take. But the thing is, is Jokic is not your unique, like he's a, he's a unique seven-footer. He's not your normal big man. And the touch that he has around the rim, in the mid-range area, and everything in between was unbelievable. I never, ever, ever want to stop watching what he's doing because he finds new ways to leverage athletic and physically gifted people into spots where they just have no idea what to do. And that was, I think, the story of last night's game where he scores 31 points, has seven rebounds, five assists, even two blocks, both on Jeremy Sohan, by the way. He does a great job of staying efficient. But it didn't start out that way. He went into the post on the very first possession of the game, actually won the tip, kind of stole the tip from Victor Wembanyama. He went into the post, immediately got blocked on the hook shot. And it was like, okay, okay, here we go. That's how it's going to be? All right. Jokic did not allow Wemby to block another shot. He was dynamic in terms of how he avoided Wemby's arms. And it was incredible to watch. He did exactly what you're hoping for big guys to do, for undersized guys to do when facing a giant like Wemby. Got into his body 
and went with the hook shot just over the outstretched arms. But he also broke out the floater in so many different scenarios, but especially in that third quarter where, yes, the lead kind of crumbled a little bit during that stretch, but it wasn't on Jokic by any stretch of the word. But Jokic just kept going to the floater over Wemby, and it was awesome to watch them kind of go back and forth where he looked like the guy in the Geico commercial that is like the fisherman in the Geico commercial that's holding the dollar out in front of the kid or, or the the person or whoever it was that was in that commercial. And you're just like, Oh, you can't get it. You can't get it. It's, it's right there, but it's, it's not within your reach. It's crazy. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And these battles are going to be insane because Wemby's going to continue to surprise Jokic. He's going to get smarter. He's going to get more athletic. He's going to get stronger. And there are going to be things that Jokic did last night that are not going to work as well going forward, but it was awesome. It was so cool to watch those two go back to for, back and forth for the second time. Denver's got another two games against San Antonio. You better believe that I'll be watching both of those two with a very, very close eye on just how this goes. Because I think that Wemby's going to be like Jokic was in his rookie season where he just kind of absorbs all this knowledge, figures out what to do, and then is better by the end of it. But it's going to be so fascinating to see those two go back and forth because Wemby is like, he is the future of the NBA, but there's just no doubt in my mind, obviously, that Jokic is the present. And how that battle goes on back and forth is going to be so fascinating. So I'm looking forward to it. That was clearly the story of the game last night. It wasn't the only thing that happened, but Jokic, 13 of 19 from the field, stays efficient, goes to the floater, shoots it over the top of Wemby just out of his reach every single time. And that's why he is the MVP, because you just can't stop what he's doing. He will find a solution. Sometimes it'll take him longer to find the solution than in other games. But it's so rare for Jokic to be caught unawares, for him to be caught by surprise by anything. And with Wemby, he sort of understood the assignment immediately based off of how they were guarding him. There were times where Denver was throwing the ball into Murray and into Gordon in the post. And then they would have Jokic as the spacer up to the top of the key. And Wemby would help over. He would be the roamer defensively. And rather than Jokic just shoot six or seven threes, which is what I think that San Antonio hoped he would do. He attempted three. He made one. And instead, he went to the floater at the elbow, just inside the elbow, pretty consistently. And that was a pretty interesting wrinkle for him. Really nice to see him find ways to attack a guy like Wemby. And I think there are going to be, like, this is a good practice for the playoffs where teams are going to throw the kitchen sink at Jokic and the Nuggets in every single way. This could be a strategy that some other teams use, although not every team has a Victor Wembanyama. So should be fascinating to track. Other notes for the starters. I thought that Aaron Gordon was mostly great last night. Seven points, seven assists. He only attempted three shots. Was one of two from the free throw line as well. Only had three rebounds, but offensive rebounding, it wasn't that big of a deal. Um. But seven assists and just one turnover. And four of the points that Gordon had were at the very beginning of the game. It was like he scored scored the first four points. The fact that he was comfortable going and taking one more shot for the rest of the game is mind-blowing. Like, it just is. You see a guy like Gordon, you see a a team like San Antonio and the way that San Antonio is trying to defend him, the way that they're trying to defend Jokic. And you would think that he'd make a bigger stink about it, but he just doesn't because he doesn't need to. And Jokic should be taking a lot of the shots that he takes. And obviously the bench had an extended run and Gordon wasn't out there. He only played 25 minutes, but it is very emblematic of the culture that he is so very much okay with the role that he played. And it's nice to see everybody sort of buy into that. I thought that Porter was pretty good. Not great. I thought he was pretty good. Definitely had some great moments, though, including the dunk in transition over Wemby. Uh, 
Wemby kind of ducked out of the way, so it was more of a business decision kind of poster, but still nice to see Porter get up there. He continues to impress as well. Uh, only shot 40% from three in this game. It felt like he should have shot higher, but is what it is. Like He's still dynamic in a lot of ways. KCP, I did not think had a good game, but he still managed to have three assists and three steals, so it's really not that big of a deal. Um, yeah, I mean, he was he was fine to subpar, in my opinion, despite the three steals. So, hey, credit to him for being able to still fill in and do some good things and fill up the box score in that manner, but I still think that there are some things that I'm not super, like, like I mean, look, KCP is going to be fine. It was just like, he's the fifth option. I'm not, I'm not concerned. And then Murray filled up the box score in a lot of ways, but most of that was in the fourth quarter with the second unit. We'll talk about them in the second segment, but Hey, 15 points, 10 rebounds, seven assists, three steals for Murray. He actually led the team in plus minus though. He did shoot six of 16 from the field and had three turnovers and kind of looked bothered a little bit by what Wemby was doing whenever he kind of drove into the rim also was kind of being bothered by Blake Wesley of all people on the perimeter. So, Hey, Spurs have some talent. They've got some guys that I think will sort of factor into their success. But what I will say, the, the play that really stands out with Murray consistently is anytime he gets Trey Jones on him, it is absolute barbecue chicken. Like anytime he gets a small guy on him and that is very important for the playoffs. It's going to be very rare for anybody smaller than like 6'3 to be playing against Murray at any point. But Denver should be trying to hunt those matchups because Murray is just absolutely rock solid in the post, around the rim, shooting over guys like that. He also scored his 8,000th point last night. Pretty cool to see. Uh, He's, I think, the seventh nugget in franchise history to do that. So he's on track to be well higher than 8,000. Uh, but we will see kind of where he gets from here. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we are going to chat about the bench. We'll spend a little bit more of an extended portion on that group, and I'm going to issue a small apology, small apology to the bench. But first, everybody, this podcast, as you know, it's brought to you by our good friends over at Superbook Sports. Did you know that Superbook, they can help you win money this season as the most trusted gambling, uh, the most trusted line in sports gambling to Las Vegas. And now you can use their promo code mile high and score up to 250 bucks with their first bet bonus. Win or lose Superbook will match your first bet up to 250 with promo code mile high. Download that Superbook Sports app, enter the promo code and you'll get 250 bucks courtesy of Superbook Sports. Visit superbook.com for terms and conditions. Gambling problem call 1-800-GAMBLER. We'll be right back on Pickaxe and Roll. And we're back. Pickaxe and roll. Ryan Blackburn here. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning into the show. Really appreciate all the love and support. I understand that, like, look, a little bit of an erratic recording schedule, but I'm going to be recording now, obviously, and then we'll be recording after Sunday's game with Swipa for weekends with Swipa. Sunday's game is going to be a 130 matinee matchup on ABC. So, Make sure and that that's 1.30 Mountain Time for what it's worth. So keep that in mind. I'm sure that I'll probably do an article really quickly. And then we'll probably go live at around 5 p.m. would be my expectation. So keep that in mind. Should be a lot of fun. Always enjoy my times with Swipa. We'll be having, a I think, an awards discussion a little bit, including some talk about the MVP. All right. Second segment here. I think that the bench deserves a ton of credit. I'm not the only one who obviously thinks this, but the bench has been much better, much better since the All-Star break. They figured some stuff out. Guys are a little bit more comfortable, and the roles are very defined. It's been been pretty solid. Reggie Jackson, kind of independent of that because he's not really... Like He is a part of the bench, but he's not involved with the bench unit that Denver's currently using mostly consistently. Denver goes to Jamal Murray at the one, 
Christian Brown and Justin Holiday on the wings, Peyton Watson at the four, and Zeke Naji at the five. They take Reggie out when they take Jokic out. And that to me makes sense because Reggie kind of handcuffing his minutes to Jokic with a lineup that works pretty well has been pretty good. But the minutes where Murray and Reggie are on the floor without Jokic are pretty bad. I know that people have always, not always, but like there's been some complaining throughout the years about Murray kind of running the second unit. He's not that great at it. He's not perfect at it. I'm just here to tell you that's what they're going to do in the playoffs. So they have to practice it. Murray will turn it up in the at the end of the regular season and into the playoffs anyway. And we're already kind of seeing that. So good to see Denver kind of go that direction. So Reggie's kind of independent of this conversation. Like he had a nice fourth quarter against Miami. I don't want to take anything away from that. Wasn't great again last night, in my opinion. I thought that there were some things that I wasn't in love with the lack of precision. I thought that there were some plays that he made and deserves credit for, but it kind of feels fluky. And if the jumper's not going down, then I don't know what to really do with it. So we'll we'll get to that in, in a later date. Not necessarily worried about it now, but I do want to issue more of a an apology to the rest of the bench unit. I had previously said prior to the All-Star break, prior to even the losing streak that Denver had, that three-game losing streak right around the trade deadline, I had said pretty consistently that I did not think that Denver's current bench unit would be good enough in the playoffs. Obviously, Murray and Gordon would be staggering with that group. But between Justin Holiday, Christian Brown, Peyton Watson, Reggie Jackson, I think that it's very fair to, I think it was very fair to have some concerns. And I voiced those concerns. I was pretty like loud and boisterous with my concerns. I don't think I was wrong. And then I kind of watch now and I see the vision of what's going on. Uh, <laughs> so it's all good. Swipe up. Oh, no. We're doing it tomorrow. We're doing it tomorrow after the Dallas game. We got to do it uh, on, on the Sunday, obviously. But because the game is Sunday in the middle of the day, we should uh, we should do it after the game. Let's do it at like 5 p.m., something like that. I think that seems, that seems pretty reasonable. <laughs> yes. Yes, I don't think I was. Re- yeah. Look, we're, we're going to wait. We're going we're gonna to wait and see. We'll, we'll see what happens with the bench unit. Um, I think, look, I, I like to think that I am very willing to admit fault, admit when I'm wrong, and not like, I, I'll, back, I'll back off the ledge from a take if I think it's wrong, if I think it's, it's not actually good. But what I will say, and just kind of the main takeaway here from this bench unit, is that when they are centered around Murray, when he is really putting pressure on the rim, then it feels like Denver gets more of what they want. A lot of times teams are doubling Murray. They are hard hedging on these pick and rolls at the top. And so when that happens, a lot of times Murray will swing the ball over to the weak side, whether that's Christian Brown or Justin Holiday or Peyton Watson, whatever. And he will, like, or one of those guys will either drive the gap and they'll try to get into the lane or they will shoot and kind of pull up a little bit. Or they'll like kind of swing it back to Murray and then he'll reset and then he'll run an ISO, something like that. And Murray's pretty good in those situations. You you want him with the ball in his hands trying to create a shot over a mismatch. That would be the, the best opportunity possible for Denver's offense. But the way that the other wings, Christian Brown and Peyton Watson, have progressed over this season, they are better players now than they were in November, than they were in December, than they were in January. And seeing where those guys have evolved over that time has given me a lot of confidence about where the bench can go. We saw some pretty tepid growth from Christian Brown throughout much of the season. Michael Malone sat down with him, had a discussion. He also got to take some time off and really get himself healthy, which I didn't realize that that was a problem. Christian would never make that excuse. I probably should have talked to him and tried to get him off record, but I never did that and didn't realize 
how much the ankles may have been bothering him. And so you kind of make these takes and you share your thoughts on these situations. And I make evaluations based off of how they, how I thought that they would go. And then it wasn't going the way that I thought it would. And then you're like, okay, uh, what do you do now? Peyton Watson obviously has grown to be better and better and better throughout the year. He hasn't really had a bad month. He's barely even had a bad couple weeks outside of like the first, like in the stretch of like game 15 to game 20 or something like that. But for the fact that they have really evolved this way and the fact that they have continued to improve has been so important because you can see the vision of what Calvin Booth, what Michael Malone, what everybody really wanted. And I'll come back to how when asking up at the trade deadline and asking like what Michael Malone would want, he, he said consistently, we don't need anything. We don't need anything at all. Obviously, Calvin listened to that. Calvin was very like he would if, if Malone had said he had wanted something, if he if he made it clear that he needed something for Denver to win. Then I think Calvin would have gone out to go get it. But it seems like Denver's in lockstep a little bit. Now, Malone did say he would like a veteran, but it's kind of hard to figure out which guy you would want. Like, And so there wasn't really a great candidate for Denver to go get. So it was nice for the solution for Denver to come from the internal, to come from within the roster for those guys that you knew would get better down the line. Christian Brown, Peyton Watson, even Julian Strother, although he's not really playing. And Justin Holiday, who has stepped into a nice role off the bench as well. It's nice for those guys to kind of step in and get better and show off what they can do and to be even improved in better situations this time around. And I also think we should talk about Zeke Naji, who is a better basketball player than he was for the first four months of the year. October, November, December, January. February rolls around, and it looks pretty good. It looks pretty solid. And that was really, really important for Denver because as helpful as DeAndre Jordan has been as a veteran for this team, Denver needed the defensive capabilities and the mobility of Zeke Naji for them to really upgrade their roster fully, for them to upgrade that bench unit. And it was just nice for Denver to find that solution internally. So I'm glad that Zeke stuck with it. I'm glad that Malone stuck with it. He was well within his rights to demand a better backup center. And the fact that he didn't, at least not to my knowledge, the fact that he didn't and then was willing to go with Zeke, I know that there was probably... There's probably some internal pressure of like, hey, we're paying this guy a bunch of money. You should probably play him at backup center, even if it's, even if it's for five minutes. But Zeke has responded. Zeke has shown a willingness to just go balls to the wall and go really hard and work as hard as possible. And that has helped him. That has helped everything kind of come into its own. Effort wasn't really a problem with Zeke before, but I think you stress you simplify his game a little bit. You get him to stop thinking about it so much. And that was, was exactly what Denver needed. So credit to Denver, credit to Zeke Naji, credit to Peyton Watson. By the way, Peyton Watson has more blocks than Giannis Antetokounmpo this year in 1,000 fewer minutes. That shit's nuts. <laughs> like that's, that is insane. And Christian Brown, the step back that he had, was bonkers as well last night. You guys see the step back that he had late in the fourth? Like, ball gets swung to him on the left side, isolates against a defender, between the legs, step back, tween, tween. Got it. Like, how insane is that? You love to see the development. You love to see the progression. These guys are playing confidently. They're doing everything they can to put themselves into positions to succeed. Jamal Murray's doing a great job of kind of steering the ship a little bit. And when Murray isn't out there, that's because Nikola Jokic is, of all people. So Denver's done a great job with this. I will probably admit like completely being wrong when the playoffs roll around and Denver is 
heading to another finals. Like that will happen. I'll probably admit fault way earlier than that. Is there a possibility that Denver gets caught because they're too young? Sure. Is there a possibility that this kind of fizzles in the playoffs and guys that are very young prove that they're very young? Sure. But that's what having the best starting unit in the NBA is for. It's for those guys to step up, play well, do everything they can to win their minutes, and play heavier minutes. We'll see what happens. But I think Denver's in a great position because of what the bench unit has done. Uh, Justin Holiday, I don't know if I mentioned him enough. Just hitting shots, spacing the floor, connecting. He's a smart defender. I don't think he's Denver's best defender by any stretch. Like Peyton Watson is probably Denver's best bench defender. But Christian Brown has his moments. Even Zeke Naji has his moments. How crazy is that? It's been good to see. Let's take another break. When we come back, we are going to do a West snapshot for the playoffs, as I did in my previous podcast. Good to see everybody in the chat. Make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Would really appreciate it. But first, here's this message from Scott DeHuff. Hey, what's up? It's DeHuff. I love to have fun. So tune into my podcast, DeHuff Uncensored. I give on-filter takes on Denver sports, crazy news from around the world. Plus, you never know which one of my characters is going to swing by. Well, I hope one of them's your mother. Oh, Connery, Mama is always here for you. What in the blue heck is going on here? So subscribe and get ready to laugh to DeHuff Uncensored anywhere you find podcasts. Follow me on social media at DeHuff Podcast. All right, back at it, pickaxe and roll. Sorry, I need to get Scott to refilm a new promo for his podcast. I need to get some other promos on here. Uh, one of the ones that I had for Good Morning Broncos, it got us demonetized because the background music was uh, was not perfect. So some of the behind the scenes stuff here, I need to need to get some more promo content for everything else that we're doing in Mile High Sports. Thank you so much for supporting us, of course. All right, final segment. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. Let's look at the West snapshot. I'm going to put this back up on the screen for those that saw this previously. Um, I did not post this on Twitter, uh, but I probably will after the show if you want to catch it again. Here is the West snapshot with Denver. Hey, look at them. They're in the one seed. That's pretty cool. Denver has 15 games left to go. They are 47 and 20. They, by the way, 10 games out, 10 wins out from tying the franchise record for NBA wins. And the reason why you can't really count the ABA wins, I went back and looked at this. There were 10 teams in the ABA at the time. And so it really does count like the 57 win season that Denver had back in 2013. That's the one that matters most. But this is the snapshot with Denver in the lead temporarily. Keep in mind, by the way, OKC has the tiebreaker over Denver. So if OKC wins, they will, like if they win their next game, they'll be back in the one. But the magic numbers are the ones that I want to point to. And I will highlight, like just looking at the columns, the losses are the most important column, obviously, because you, you can make up wins, you cannot make up losses that you incur on your record. So the way that you calculate these magic numbers is you basically say, okay, how many wins can the Phoenix Suns in seventh, how many wins can they get? Well, they have 28 losses, so they have the max that they could get is 54 wins. So that means that Denver has to outpace them and get to 55 wins in order to clinch. Now, they could also help themselves by defeating the Phoenix Suns head-to-head. -head. But that means basically that Denver needs to get to 55 wins, so you add eight to their win total. That is the magic number eight for claiming a top six seed and avoiding the play-in. This is a good thing for Denver because the magic number for top six is eight. The magic number for top four is nine. And with the Clippers losing last night, I think that a top three seed is all but, like, it's not guaranteed because Denver, they're only four losses above the Clippers, but they do have the tiebreaker over, actually, oh no, they don't have the tiebreaker yet. They're two and one against the Clippers so far this year. If they beat the Clippers in early April, that basically guarantees that they will be top three. And it feels kind of like Denver's going to be top one. Like just 
looking at this. So really important for Denver. Actually, I'll put this back up on the screen just really briefly. The reason why the magic numbers for the top one are both 16 for Denver and OKC, Denver only has 15 games left. So if they win all 15, they get to 62 wins. But if OKC wins their remaining 16 games, which they won't, but like, bear with me, then they tie Denver at 62. So OKC in that case would get the tiebreaker and Denver would be the two seed. So Denver needs at least one OKC loss plus their 15 wins. That generates the magic number of 16. The West is really shaping up to the point where, like uh, Miki says here, T-Wolves games will be key ones. Any matchup that Denver has against teams that are in the West, West teams that are kind of competing with them, whether that's Phoenix, whether that's the Clippers, whether that's the T-Wolves. I think those are the only three that are in the top group that is actually like competing with Denver. I think those are the only ones that you really need to worry about from a standings perspective because they can count for double. Like you can win those, but then if you win, that means the other team gets a loss and it helps you clinch a little bit sooner. But it could really shape the playoffs towards the end of it. Uh, just kind of putting this back up on screen here. Let me check in with this again. Look at that play in group. That's where I'm going to focus on for the final stretch of this pod. Phoenix, Dallas, LA, Golden State. Which of those four teams is the most dangerous? Which of those four teams would you not want to face? Which of those four teams would you want to face? Because right now for Denver, they're in the one seed, so they're going to face the winner of the like 8-9 game, which is like the loser of the 7-8 versus the winner of the 9-10. That's what that would look like. So Denver would face one of those four teams, but it's unclear which one they would face at this point. Which one in the comments would you want to face if you were in Denver's position? I think that there's a couple of candidates here, but I don't think Denver should be fearful of any of the teams. But I do think that the Suns, probably the most dangerous of that group, with the way the way that they could get up to the max levels offensively, I think that they are the most dangerous for sure. Uh, was looking up some numbers. When Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, and Bradley Beal all share the floor, the Suns have a 125 offensive rating on cleaning the glass. It's really good. It was really, really good. Can they maintain that against Denver? I don't know. Maybe. Can they be good enough to really be a problem for Denver and push them to six games in a first round series? Seven games in a first round series? Yeah, I think so. I think with the way that Nurkic has shown that he could stay healthy and defend, I think with the way that Drew Eubanks has done pretty well against Jokic, not like that's not a matchup that Jokic can't solve. But like Eubanks is functional in that in that way. I think that the Suns are probably the most dangerous team of that group. I actually did a poll of this on Twitter, I think yesterday or the day before. Um, let me just pull that up real quick if I can. I might not be able to. Um, yeah, always, always great to not be able to pull it up. Okay, over 2,100 votes from Nuggets fans. The Lakers are the team that Nuggets fans would want to face overwhelmingly with a 42% margin. Golden State is second at 32%. Dallas is third at 22%. And Phoenix is all the way in fourth at 3%. So that's pretty interesting. Everybody's pretty universally thinking, yeah, the Suns are going to be the most dangerous of those teams. So if you're Denver and you see, for example, let's go pull this back up. If you see this breakdown, Phoenix in seven, Dallas in eight, Lakers in nine, Golden State in 10, I think you'd be pulling for Phoenix in a Phoenix-Dallas mashup. And that's pretty dangerous because Luka loves to kill Dallas. He is great in the playoffs. He is a fantastic matchup for a team like that. And if you're Denver, that's 
that's dangerous. So that would put Phoenix back into the eighth seed. But then, you know, they're going to be facing one of the Lakers or the Warriors in a potential matchup to face Denver. So I wonder which of those teams would be better in a play-in matchup. I think the Lakers, Lakers are probably a good matchup in the play-in for that particular stuff. So I'm curious to see how it breaks down. Let me know in the comments who you would want to face and who you would want to to kind of break it down in a play-in matchup, in a playoff matchup for Denver. Um, Luca, Suns killer from DY. Uh, Nadine says Doncic would give us serious problems. Doncic would. I'm not sure anybody else really would. I just watching the way that Dallas plays and the way that they played in that OKC game in a game where team is very competent on the other side. They're good defensively. How does Dallas respond? PJ Washington didn't really show up. Daniel Gafford is extremely dependent on the guys ahead of him. And I don't know, man, if, if, if Denver has to try to score against a Gafford, PJ Washington, Luka Doncic front court, I think they will be okay. It would be difficult for me to foresee the the Mavericks outscoring Denver when they could get a pretty open shot pretty much every single time in a comfortable position. So I'm curious. Like, let, let me know what you guys think, though. I'm, I'm, I want to see what everybody believes. Denver's in a good spot. Denver's in a good position. They are playing really well. They're doing fantastically. It's hard because, like, I always thought that they could get to this level. There's no doubt about it. How long they want to sustain it? Like, will they break the franchise record in wins? I don't know. Like, they are very close. They need to go 11 and four the rest of the way in order to do so. And Denver's schedule is tough enough that I think they they could definitely drop some of those games. So we will see what happens, but I'm very curious. Let me know whether you think Denver breaks the franchise record. Let me know who you think Denver should face in the play in, uh, the playoffs first round coming out of the play-in tournament. will be very interesting to see. All right, folks. I think that is going to do it for the episode of Pickaxe and Roll, brought to you by our good friends over at Superbook Sports. Make sure to go check out Swipe a Cam uh, in the ch- uh, like when you're just looking for other Nuggets content. He is going live at noon as he made sure to just – absolutely drop in and, and make sure to let everybody know that he's going live. So go check out swipe a cam in the YouTube section. Thank you so much, everybody for tuning in. Really appreciate all the love and support on the podcast. Hit the like button on the way out. Um, Cedric says also Ryan have a watch party here in Las Vegas. When you come summertime, I, I would love to come out to Vegas for summer league. We'll see whether it can happen. I'm, I'm not sure, but we'll, uh, we'll play that bone by ear. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show. Leave a like button on the way out. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow.